Hello! My name is Juliana Fessenden and I am a Los Alamos Mountaineer and I'm here with Michael Altair who's also a Mountaineer and one of my favorites, uh, a fantastic mentor and leader of many trips and I have the opportunity today to interview him. Well, thank you, Juliana. It's, it's a pleasure to be here with you, spend the afternoon yeah. part of it. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I have a series of qu questions I'm going to ask Michael, and uh, I just want you to share your experience with, uh, with the world. <laughs> <laughs> okay? So uh, we'll start. So what inspired you to join the Los Alamos Mountaineers? Well, uh, I will share with you a number of stories uh, this afternoon. Um, I was really fortunate to grow up during a time when mountaineering was um, really just sort of at the cusp of the, what I'll call the classic period. Um, I was actually uh, sitting in a guard shack at Chicago O'Hare International Airport where I was a security guard at the time on the day that the first American expedition set foot on K2. Uh, all of my high school and college career, I had a picture of K2 sitting in my, in my bedroom, whether it was at home, while I was still at home in high school or in college. And uh, I had been inspired by K2, having, having read The Savage Mountain, uh, following the 1953 uh, Great Expedition, it's probably known as one of, one of America's great, great mountaineering expeditions. And participants on that expedition included uh, a gentleman that I would come to meet here while I was interviewing, George Bell. Uh, George and I became um, colleagues and friends. Um, I'm actually probably one of the last people who had to get a signature of an existing member for, to join the American Alpine Club. And I wish I'd have kept that because I had George Bell nominate me for membership. So that was really kind of cool. But uh, as I was interviewing here, I met, a, I met some scientific greats, Walter Goad, who started the, the GenBank. Uh, and part of that interview process, I sat in George Bell's office and, and interviewed with him. Uh, over the years, George and I ended up working on projects together. Uh, and a lot of my mountaineer, best mountaineering experiences are vic were vicarious mountaineering experiences, whether it be uh, sitting in the car, traveling with George, listening to him tell stories about flying into Peru under the cloud cap uh, to a land before they went out and did their, their, their basically historic climbs down in Peru, uh, listening to his stories of, of, uh, of being up on K2 uh, and, and um, uh, various other uh, great peaks, inc including our, our spirit mountain for the club. So it's, uh, uh, it, it, was, it was meeting, meeting George, uh, coming to Los Alamos uh, and, and having the opportunity uh, for the first time to actually join the climbing school back, I think it was 1993. So it was, uh, um, it was, it was just a harmonic convergence of a lot of wonderful things uh, and, and you know, finding this great community of climbers here. Uh, even though I came late to the sport, I, I had been a, uh, a wannabe, I still am a wannabe mountaineer. Uh, uh, I, 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 you know, stood on the street corners waiting for public transportation in Chicago in, in really cold weather while I would sneak uh, peeks reading Annapurna and, and re-envision the, the thoughts of Maurice Herzog's gloves skittering away down the side of the mountain. So, so you know, it was just, again, it was just a big harmonic convergence of, of factors that, that led me to join the Mountaineers. And when I had the opportunity to rub elbows with the likes of George and Don Liska, uh, Aichi uh, of Fukushima, who was the first summiteer of uh, of Mount Vincent. I mean, there's just great, great people here, and people who I'd read about, and, and here I was actually going out and playing with them, uh, and, and, and it was just, it was a phenomenal uh, opportunity. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I could have met all these people. <laughs> I, I am a newcomer to the Los Alamos Mountaineers, been here four years. These are great people. 
I'm so glad that you've been able to <laughs> yeah, was, interface. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, um, hmm. so I shared a little bit about you know growing up in Chicago um, uh, in the frozen wastelands of uh, concrete jungle in the winter time. For some reason, I've developed a really strong affinity for being in the mountains, particularly in the winter. Uh, there, there's something uh, ethereal to me about being in the mountains in the winter time. Um, uh, I, I'm a bit of a, I guess, mountaineering loner. I like to be in small groups. I'm not, I'm not plussed by being around crowds. It really sort of is a turnout for me. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm, I'm married to a, a wonderful woman, Michelle, who, who, who allows me to go off on my adventures. I have two great kids, uh, my daughter Heather, who now is uh, finishing up a master's degree in, um, in Tucson at the U of A. Uh, she, she's an adventurer in her own right. She, she spent multiple years in the Peace Corps, uh, ended up finding and marrying a, a South African bush pilot who is a great guy, and, and that's turned out to be a, a, a splendid uh, opportunity for me to go visit them and adventure with them in the, in the desert. And uh, my son, Forrest, who's become really um, a much more serious climber and mountaineer than I, is, I was ever, who lives in Salt Lake City. Um, uh, Forrest is, uh, uh, I, I take great pride in Forrest's approach to mountaineering. He's, he's, he's become a bit of an adventure climber. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't think, you know, about, you know, he, he challenges himself in a variety of really unique ways, whether that's climbing free rider so that he can do it in a free style, or whether it's going out into the remote areas of Zion or, or the Nevada desert to find places that it's actually hard for him to get partners to go with <laughs> to set up new routes. And he's, he's set up a couple of really significant new routes in the last few years that, that, that are really, in my opinion, quite inspiring. So um, I'm, I'm a very fortunate man that I've had both the ability to adventure, a spouse who supports it, and a couple of great kids. So yeah. I'm, I'm very glad that you shared your love for adventuring with your family. That's something I'm also trying to do with my kids. My, my kids will tell you a story, and it's kind of fun, that they, you know, we, we, we did a, on the 200th anniversary of the uh, uh, Voyage of Discovery, the, the Lewis and Clark trip, we, we took a float trip down the Missouri River uh, from Fort Benton to the Charlie uh, Russell Wildlife uh, Refuge, 165 miles on the river. And, and both kids will tell you that uh, while their friends were going off to Disneyland and Disney World, mom and dad were hauling them down the Missouri River through, uh, through uh, uh, swarms of black flies and <laughs> other, such, other such adventures. So yeah, <laughs> somehow or other, they were not uh, uh, turned off by adventure, but fell in love with it themselves. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. What activities have you done with the Los Alamos Mountaineers? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I, I, I started, again, uh, with the club, as so many of us did over the years, with the climbing school. And I find it very unfortunate that the litigious nature of our society has, has made it so difficult for us to continue that tradition. The, the, the Mountaineers have as part of their mandate uh, the continuation of, of an educational paradigm for, for, for new people in the community who enter the community, this very dynamic community, because we have so uh, many people who come here because of the lab. And, and that has, over, over the years, sort of fallen a bit by the wayside, largely because we're, we're struggling with how do we how do we manage a climbing school for a club with a $10,000 a year budget where you know, if, if somebody were to get hurt and, and bring some kind of lawsuit, you know, that, that would be gone in the first probably you know, three hours of consultation with an attorney. So that, that's, that I find to be unfortunate. But uh, I, oh, that aside, uh, I have served as the program chair for, for the uh, uh, for the club, I was. I'm a past president of the club. Um, I, I've 
participated. One of my one of my great adventures with a, was with a guy named Stu Bowling, who brought us into the uh, uh, Cirque of the Towers up in Wyoming in the Bridger Wilderness, and, and we we climbed the classic Pingora Peak and the Wolf's Head, uh, it, which appears in in uh, Roper and Steck's 50 classic climbs. Uh, spectacular trip that one was. Uh, uh, I've, I've actually participated uh, as, as a trip leader in a number of instances. I, I think the club used to do a lot more sort of what I'll call uh, adventure or mountaineering tourism, um, uh, where, where we would go to you know, famous climbing places like the Grand Teton. I led a trip to the Grand Teton where I was pleased to, to get a group of 12, out of 12 people, eight people managed the summit. Uh, that, was a, that was a fun trip. Uh, as you know, I've tried to uh, sort of uh, uh, recreate some ice climbing opportunities. And we'll, we'll you know, over pre-pandemic, we had, I think, our last, our last sort of uh, ice climbing outing, which, which was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, I also led a trip. Uh, uh, up Mount Whitney and uh, was able to climb one of the classic routes uh, on Mount Whitney at the time, which was probably not one of my best planning efforts because prior to going and doing a technical climb on Mount Whitney, I spent the prior two weeks in Hawaii on the beach. And so I'd pretty much given up all my acclimatization at that point in time and found that to be a little bit more burdensome than I'd anticipated. Uh, but uh, but you know, that, that, those are the sorts of things I do. Um, I've recently retired. Uh, and one of my post-retirement goals is, is actually to uh, get an accreditation as, as an avalanche instructor. Uh, and also as a uh, uh, wilderness first aid instructor, so that so that in this community we can create a uh, a dynamic training environment, so that we're 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 prepared for those mountain adventures that that we go out and do. So those are those are sort of some of my my goals and my my current relationship with the club. So, yeah. That's so valuable. I, I got to <laughs> tell you, as a newbie, uh, having the wilderness first aid Abbey refreshers that yeah. I participated in is so important for outdoor safety and uh, feeling like you can you can survive yeah yeah one of one of my mottos is, is that you know everything I do today is training for what I will do tomorrow and and one of the things I've learned over the years through my experience with the mountaineers when I've set higher objectives for myself is is the um, is is the importance of building confidence. So, so these sort of training activities build a level of confidence that lets you go out there and push the envelope a little bit further all, all the time. And, and it's, you know, whether, you're, whether it has to do with um, your physical training, your mental training, um, uh, your ability to respond in a out of normal circumstance, those are, those are you know, being familiar with and doing that sort of thing is, I, I think, is important, and is one of the things I, I look forward to continuing th with my relationship with the club. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's yeah. a service for all of us. <laughs> um, what are your favorite outdoor adventures? Which adventure stands out the most in your mind? Oh, so I did share with you some of of. Um, uh, the outdoor adventures I've done with the club, but I would I would have to say looking back, um, it's the ones sort of that I do with my kids. Um, uh, I I've I've not put up a first descent anywhere. I think I may have put up a first descent. I know it's the first documented descent uh, going in going into a local canyon. Um, I did I did that. Um, initial exploration of, of that particular canyon with my daughter and having her there and participating in that was great. Uh, I've had several really great adventures with my son. Um, we, we, we spent a couple of nights together on Moonlight Buttress in Zion National Park under a full moon, uh, which was just phenomenal uh, for me. He, again, he, he, he pulled my sari behind up most of that hill, uh, but it was, it was great. And then together, uh, we we went. Uh, he was he was on a um, 
uh, educational uh, uh, program in Peru uh, while he was working at Emory on his Master's of Public Health. And I was able to go down and join him at the, tri at the end of that trip and uh, got to uh, climb a, a mountain down there called Yanapacha. Uh, and uh, together we, we summited. Uh, we had a guide, of course. So again, it's not real mountaineering. It's sort of, it's sort of um, mountain tourism. If you climb with a guide or you climb on a fixed line or you do any of that, that's just tourism. It's not really mountaineering. But it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was really a great experience to be able to do that with him. We, we got just short of 18,000 feet. Um, it's kind of entertaining in Peru. You get to a point where um, uh, you step out of the truck on the way to the base camp, and you're um, uh, you're setting a high altitude record for yourself. So <laughs> yeah. I think the truck pulled over at 15,000 plus feet. And, you know, prior to that, I'd I'd never been above 14,000 yeah. here in the states. So yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, so, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. That's amazing. yeah. Um, what experience taught you the most important lesson about outdoor safety? Oh, okay. Yeah, probably one of the things that sort of drove me to this educational paradigm that I'm trying to pursue right now as part of, as part of my retirement uh, was having an avalanche cut loose underneath the back of my skis uh, uh, just off of Homestake Peak uh, up near Tennessee Pass in Colorado. Uh, 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 a really good friend of mine uh, over the years, and, and one of my favorite mountaineers in the club, a guy named Mario Scalacci, uh, uh, has had has had this uh, hut trip going on for oh, it's probably close to 30 years now. And and uh, when I joined that trip, I was I was uh, I was one of the puppies, and I think the last time we went out, I was the old man. So we've been doing it for a while, <laughs> and. Uh, um, it's you know it's always it's always been great and so as as the years went on I got to be a more confident backcountry skier I would I would go out and start doing some of my own uh, uh, sort of side trips out of the hut and we were staying at the uh, I believe it's the 10th Mountain Division hut which is just just at the base of a bowl uh, that that is surrounded sort of by Homestake Peak and it's a uh, it's beautiful area and I you know. Myself and one of one of the other members of of Mario's team on that year uh, decided we would go up and summit Homestake Peak and then traverse across the ridge uh, over to a, a, a side ridge that looked like it had a really nice slope, nice beautiful gladed ski. Uh, but to get there, we had to cross two very steep, uh, hard pack um, uh, couloirs, and. Uh, uh, my partner had gotten a little bit ahead of me, and he, he managed to get a both, across both couloirs. And I got up to that first couloir, and you know, I wasn't sure I wanted to spend the two and a half hours to tr back track uh, the way I'd come. So, so I, made, I made the decision to, to angle my skis across to a little rock outcropping. I was a little aggravated with, with my partner because he got a bit further ahead of me than I would have liked. But uh, you know we were where we were, and I had to get across. So as uh, I cut across that first couloir, just above, uh, I mean just below uh, uh, the pinnacle of the of the ridge, going across the couloir, thinking that I would be perfectly safe. It was a windward slope. Uh, it was basically rock hard neve. Uh, it it you know, and I was I was just cutting for for this rock outcrop on the other side. And I was, um, I just pulled up in that, in that rock outcrop and I was sort of standing, uh, uh, balancing on, on a rock and I had this strange sensation of m movement sort of encompass me. And, and I looked behind me and the entire slope was rolling away and it rolled down about, oh, 600, 700 feet in, in large chunks. Uh, it was definitely a hard slab uh, that I managed to not get caught in, uh, but I wasn't going to go any further uh, along that route, and I basically climbed down the, the debris field out to, uh, and you'd think I might have known better because the, I think the, the little cirque at the bottom is called Avalanche Lake. <laughs> but anyway, climbed down to that, and I thought, you know, uh, I, I had euphemistically picked up a few 
uh, things along along the way about avalanches. In fact, I I I, I took. Uh, an avalanche, my first avalanche uh, uh, refresher with a with a with a uh, member of the club, a guy named Rich Davidson, who who's since passed. Who again was another one of these guys I became good friends with during during the short period of time I got to to be associated with him, and and it it you know. I realized I didn't know as much as I needed to to be really good in the mountains, and I figured I figured. If I was in that situation, I was out with guys who'd been in the mountains for 20 plus years. Uh, there, there were probably other folks um, uh, that that could use a little bit of that. And so I guess it's been now what five years or so that I've been offering this Avi refresher. Um, um, usually about this time of year, although with the current weather conditions, I, we'll see if this year's goes. But we'll we'll try and make it happen somewhere. So, so yeah, that, and and so I've actually. I've actually managed now to uh, get certed as an avalanche professional, uh, and and I'm following up that to try and get an instructor's training cer certification, uh, and and I look forward to being able to provide uh, that for uh, a younger cadre of of people as they come into the community and and start to think about slapping on boards and going out into the backcountry. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So, so with that story, what happened to your partner? Uh, so he had, he had gotten across both of those couloirs. So he was waiting for me on the other side. So um, I, I descended down the avalanche path, thinking that was probably the safest place to be, except there was one point where those two couloirs joined together. And I thought, if the, if the, and I had, I had to walk past that joining spot. So I was a little concerned about that still. So I, I figured he'd made the decision he was on his own because he obviously wasn't, wasn't waiting for me. <laughs> and, and I figured he had, to, he had to make it back. So I got back to the hut, and I was a little bit juiced on adrenaline. Um, and uh, I waited for a little while. I was just getting ready to go back out uh, and up the, the, um, the direction where we had planned to ski down, and he, he walked into the hut. So yeah, er everything came out OK. Yeah. Yeah, probably very relieved that you were there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, he he actually was in a position where he was able see to it? see the 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 whole thing that happened. Yeah, yeah. I don't think he felt the same adrenaline rush that I did though. <laughs> probably not. So, yeah. Okay. What is the most important thing you do when you are preparing for a trip? Oh, um, good question. Um, I would say I think about. Uh, what it is I need for the trip, first and foremost, you know, uh, I used to carry a lot more stuff than I do. As I've gotten older, I, I've started to uh, pay more money uh, for <laughs> for gear so it'll be lighter weight. But there was a time I climbed with an SLR camera uh, and lenses. Uh, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I'm really glad for the digital technology, especially on a phone. But I still carry an accessory small digital camera. Uh, uh, I, 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 I look at, at the base equipment that I need. I think about contingencies. Um, w you know, I want to make sure that as a collective, the team, that we have the appropriate uh, rescue gear and first aid stuff. So, so I'll usually carry a a fairly uh, full first aid kit, especially for a multi-day trip. Um, and then if somebody else, you know, at the trailhead, I will talk with all of the participants and try and figure out uh, what is their level of training in terms of first aid, what is their level of training in terms of, of avalanche or crevasse rescue or any of those things that, that might come into play during that trip. Uh, and then as I listen to what they're bringing, I tend to jettison my stuff into the back of the car. Uh, but anything that's not being a, uh, 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 carried by some member of, of the group, I'll make sure that we, we have it if I think it's something that we need. Uh, so I would say, uh, what, what do you need for your, for, for your personal comfort? Um, you know, it's not just surviving out there, it's thriving. So uh, uh, what do you need for your personal comfort? What do you need uh, to ensure the safety and welfare of the group? Uh, 
and and then you know what is it uh, that that uh, wh wh where are the members of the group in terms of their training and stuff and and I, I think the trip we took to the Grand Teton, uh, I think it was 2016, was a great example of that. We had we had several. Um, uh, uh, group meetings at the house beforehand. We talked to everybody who was going. We made sure everybody's expectations were clear that this was not a guided trip, that you were going to have to climb yourself to get up this. Uh, there wasn't anybody who's going to be short hauling anybody else up the hill. Uh, that, that each of the teams, uh, uh, we were there for a week and we had teams going out continuously. I did take a level of responsibility to make sure that I felt that everybody there uh, uh, came back, you know, checked in, did those various things. Uh, uh, then we we did a number of pre-trip climbs together. We 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 had the whole crew. We went out and did cameras on, you know. Uh, the Grand isn't anything particularly tough, uh, but but it, you know, people do die on it, and and so making sure that people are reasonably competent and confident and that you're not putting them into a situation where they can't be successful is important. Uh, and so that, that's always, that, you know, when I'm, when I'm leading a trip for the club, it's really important to me to ensure that, that everybody can be as successful that, that we, uh, as, they, as they can and that we, we uh, uh, do what's necessary to, to ensure their, that they have a good time, that it's not just a death march. <laughs> you know, that, yeah. yeah, you've been on a couple of my trips. I hope they're not the death marches. So. They're not at all. They're wonderful. And, and I do feel so, very safe. Yeah. You do walk us through yeah. uh, what to expect, what the dangers are. You know, we go through our packs. And so it's a really yeah. good collective uh, awareness before yeah. we start out. And yeah. it, it makes me feel good as yeah. a beginner. Yeah. Well, yeah. oh, good. I'm glad. I, that, that's nice feedback. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what lessons from your mountaineering experiences would you like to share with the next generation? Oh. Yeah, this is an this is this is an interesting time I think in climbing, and I I've, I you know I shared with you that that I sort of grew up on the cusp of the classic mountaineering experience. Um, uh, you know, I, I, again I can remember exactly where I was when I heard for the first time that Americans had summited K2, and I'd been familiar with 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 the prior expeditions and stuff, and and coming to Los Alamos and rubbing elbows. Uh, with with the likes of the folks that that I had the opportunity to climb with, uh, whether you know it, it, you know Mario Scalacci, Paul Arndt, uh, Rich Davidson, uh, uh, the George Bells, and, and you know the really the iconic guys like George Bell and Don Liska, uh, 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 Aichi, uh, you know those folks took time to spend with newbies like me. Uh, uh, wannabe mountaineers and 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 took us out into the field and and prepared us and and pushed us. I mean, you know, you could talk to some people who were on some of Don Liska's uh, treks that were that were a bit of death marches, but you know they, they were you know they were challenging to me. They weren't death marches. Uh, you know, George. Dave Brown, another guy. I, George Bell invited me to go on a ski trip one time with Dave Brown and a couple of the other members. I think Rich Davidson was on it, and said, "Oh yeah, we always like to bring out some young blood to break trail for us, right?" And I'm like, "Sure, you know, I'm going out with these 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 mountaineering icons in in, in my in my mind, and and I'm going to go out there and break trail." I did everything I could to stay up with those guys, and they were they were all. You know, 20 plus years older than me. I was, just, I was sucking wind really bad, and and it was a hoot. And they they they, they were all great sports about it, and and, and so um, I would like to see the next generation. Uh, the, the, we we have we have a cadre of of people to that that need to step up, and and you know I I I understand that there are some. There are always personality conflicts. They've gone on in the club forever, you know, and, and some of the younger people may be turned off by some of the elders in the club. But, you know, 
it's, it's time for the next generation to step up into a role of leadership. I, my, my great disappointment, I think, <clears throat> when I was club president, I was looking to try and get somebody 10 or 15 years younger than me to step up into a role as, 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 uh, uh, as president. And, and I, I would really like to see that next generation em, embrace uh, that, that opportunity and, and, and see that move forward. So uh, that, that's really uh, uh, what, I, what I would like to see. You know, if, if there was something I, I could do, if I were queen for a day. <laughs> so. so so I've got some ideas on that. Okay. Uh, so I am a newbie, mm -hmm. and I am intimidated to lead yeah. uh, various mountaineering trips because I'm worried that someone's going to get hurt, ah. and that I won't have the experience to know yeah. what to do. Yeah. So what I'm encouraging uh, people to consider is to be a deputy mm -hmm, leader mm -hmm. to one of the senior people. So they yeah. get the experience yeah. of how to lead trips, how to, um, how to prepare, yeah. have these safety uh, discussions before. I think, I think the, you know, the club has four elected positions and, and a number of dynamic board positions that have changed around over time. And I think one thing that uh, I, I've, I've looked at in the last few years, the model of the Seattle Mountaineers and the Portland Manzamas, and, and, and they do provide sort of a, sort of a you almost call it a merit bat or a meritocracy system to become a leader. I think one of the things where our, our club should consider is I think we should have some kind of a safety officer uh, that, that would help uh, newbie leaders to, to be, be comfortable in that role. And you know, the, you know, the last, I mean, uh, you know, we, we have this horrible uh, thing in this town about training, right? Because we do all this nonsense training at the lab. Uh, you know, I think you know you have to you know you have to do paperclip training, and you know so so that you don't punch your eye out with a paperclip and stuff. Yep. You know, it's it, it's just way over the top, and so people r resist that. But but ensuring you know that 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 a trip has somebody on it that that you feel comfortable with has has their first aid certification, or or if if it's you know if if you you're, you're interested in going out and, and going to a hut for the first time, but you know you're going to be an avalanche. You know somebody that, that you're with who's at least had an airy one level course, something of, of that nature on your trip that, that, that can help ad advise in those, those crux moments when you, you, you have to make a decision. How do we manage getting across? This, this slope looks kind of dicey to me. What do we do? Well, we send one person across at a time. We make sure we, we do a double check, make sure everybody's beacons are working, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, go get to the hut, make do before you go out in day ski, make sure that that people's transceivers are turned off, that you have a spare set of battery, you know, just there's so many little silly things like that, that we need to sort of look out for each other in, in that regard. And I think that's, you know, you, you know, I've I think having having co-leaders or, or 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 somebody who would just uh, you know sit as your co-pilot is a, is a great idea, you know. But we do have some we do have some outstanding young mountaineers in the club, yeah. who 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 are who are are doing some pretty cutting edge things, and and you know they're you know they come to the interesting talks. And stuff, but they they're they're not giving back. In my own personal experience in this regard, uh, I had sort of drifted away from the mountaineers after after some time. Uh, and you know, I, I shared with you the, the the trip into the Cirque of the Towers with with Stu, and you know, I'd started going out and just doing my own things. And Zach Baker buttonholed me uh, in the Smith's parking lot one day and said. You need to get on the board, and and Zach is a hard guy to say no to, yeah. and and I couldn't at that time, and I re-engaged with the club, and 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 I've stayed connected since, and and you know I I think there are there's there's a substantial wealth of knowledge in our young membership that that could contribute, it it just seems like. 
they're so focused on their own personal objectives that, that they have a hard time thinking about how to share that experience uh, with, 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 their, with their comrades and fellows uh, um, uh, you know, uh, around them. So, so things like you know, helping you out on a, on a ski tour, you know, there, there are plenty of folks who could, who could do that. You know, so it shouldn't just be me. shouldn't just be uh, you know, so, somebody else. You know, it's it's, it's how, do we, how do we reinvigorate the youthful uh, membership and, and get them involved to help support folks like yourself? Yeah, so it's a it's a good challenge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what has the out of doors meant for your life? Yeah, so as a kid who grew up on the north side of Chicago, I was extremely fortunate. My grandparents had bought uh, a cabin on a northern lake, just about ninety miles south of Lake Superior in Wisconsin. So, so. The concept of being in the woods for me was very important in my, my whole life. Uh, whether, I'm, whether, I'm, whether I'm climbing a mountain with no trees to be seen for a thousand plus feet below me or what have you, I always refer to it as being out in the woods. That, that, you know, it, it's, it's a place where I find, um, um, I, I find a certain refuge. I find, uh, I find peace. Uh, I, I think... Uh, um, uh, Anatoly um, uh, Bokhrev, I think, said it best. Uh, you know, m mountains are the cathedrals where I practice my religion, and 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 that's really the way I feel. I feel I feel very special when I'm in the mountains. Like I'm in a really special place. I, I take great offense when I when I'm when I'm camping at a high altitude camp, and I go around a bend and it's it's littered with toilet paper and human feces and and you know I've gotten to a point where whatever I carry in I carry out regardless of whether it's shape shifted or not so <laughs> it comes out with me you know uh, the mountains are fragile uh, our our environment is fragile um, I like I like to be in places where, where I'm where I'm alone in the mountains. But I respect the places where th that attract large numbers of people. Um, you know, I had I had wannabe wishes to to do the nose on El Cap for years, uh, but I would find it hard to do that anymore, given given the crowds. It's it's almost as well. I shouldn't say it because I haven't spent much time. My my son would admonish me for speaking out of out of turn here. Uh, but but I, I see you know the face of El Cap. Not that much different than the valley itself in terms of the density of people on it at any given Sunday. So, so it's just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more happy carrying uh, a fairly large pack somewhere into a remote area. And if that includes a climbing rack, so be it. You know, so I'll, I'll, I'll do that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, did that answer the question? It, it did. <laughs> okay. It did. Okay. Uh, and, and this concludes our questions. Oh, okay. Is, is there anything else that you would like to share with the Mountaineers oh. and the audience that uh, goes beyond these questions? Oh, uh, you know, I've been very fortunate to, to, to have, have made a, 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 a solid career as a scientist here in Los Alamos. Um, I, was, I was very fortunate um, to, to run into the people that I did here. Um, it, it's you know, every every I guess generation has has its has its own uh, claim to uh, to the classic period I guess. But 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 I I find myself uh, still interested in adventures. I, I I look forward. I hope I hope I still have a Himalayan trek left in me. Uh, it's a place I would like I would like to get. Uh, hopefully. Uh, Pandemics uh, settled down, uh, you know, before my ability to get out and get about have uh, has has gone by, and uh, um, you know I'm I'm looking forward to getting back out in the mountains and uh, getting away from the camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate all of the time and the the depth and uh, of what you've done and accomplished and the lessons you have to teach well, the I, Los Alamos Mountaineers. I, I have to say, um, uh, you know, that, that at best I'm a hack climber, um, that to me a true mountaineer is also an explorer. 
Uh, when I look back historically at, at, at just some iconic mountaineering adventures, things like the discovery of the Nanda Devi Sanctuary, it took 50 years from when, when it was first spied by, by uh, a, a European to the, the time that of the first European was able to find a way into that. So that sense of exploration is, is there for me. I, I don't confuse that with adventure tourism, you know, cli climbing to the top of Mount Everest, uh, having someone set a line for me so I jumard to the top has no interest to me. And I think people need to distinguish adventure tourism from, from the true explorations that guys like Steve Swenson, who, who uh, is my age and just won the Academy Award for climbing the Palais d'Or uh, this last year for climbing Lynx Sar with, with, with two young guys, Chris Wright and Graham Zimmerman, and, and an, another middle-aged climber, Mark Ritchie. Uh, those, th what those guys are doing uh, just sets, you know, sets a standard for true mountaineering um, uh, adventure and uh, uh, that you know if 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 I could do something like that in my lifetime yet yeah, I would but I think I'm destined to be the adventure tourist and and that's that, that that's just fine yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and I'm I'm an aspiring adventure tourist <laughs> hope to get there yeah well thank you very much well thank you for having well this concludes our interview with Michael Altair we hope to have several more in the next couple, couple months. Uh, we are an organization of about 450 people, and we're always looking for more adventurers uh, to come and join us, whether we go mountain biking, water skiing, snow skiing, kayaking, climbing, out there in the back country. Please do join us. If you want to know more, please look at lamountaineers.com.org lamountaineers.org and we're there's a bunch of people who are willing to and happy to bring in new people and share what we do um, out in the mountains thank you <laughs>